Woohoo! It is the driveway to hell. It's actually my driveway and it is a bit hellish around here. Jokes. Um, coming live from Witness, Cheshire, uh, where I live. Uh, it's good to see you all, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thanks for joining. Um, nice special little driveway to hell. This one is brought to you by Downforce Radio. Uh, get involved. Um, excellent radio station, actually, and quite motorsport orientated. I love it, uh, personally. Do quite a lot with those guys. Uh, me and Jake Sanson, who you're going to hear from in a short while, uh, do something called the Undercut, and uh, we speak about British touring cars, tin tops, and national racing national national racing national national racing in general uh, that's what i love about this show you can kind of like it's like live isn't it i could like edit that and re-go again but i can't be bothered um so yeah we talk about everything uh motorsport wise m based on toker more um but yeah it's good because jake sanson is a proper guy knows everything about racing so i love working with him and that and talking about racing in general which is Cool, so make sure you go and have a look at Downforce Radio because it is wicked and the tunes are boss actually as well. Proper boss and I'm not messing. Um, I'm Paul O'Neill by the way, just to say uh, who I am because you might not know, I don't know, I don't assume things. Um, about a week ago I asked people out there um, if you wanted me to answer any of your questions and I was snowed under, I'll be honest, which was immense. We like that, don't we? Um, so yeah, so I've got your questions here in front of me and then we'll be speaking to Jake Sanson about uh, what he thinks about Brands Hatch and uh, in general we'll be both previewing the British Touring Car round that is coming up this weekend. Lovely. Um, got you all here. <laughs> so we will go through them. Right, let's just make sure my phone is off because honestly I'm getting battered here uh, by people. Um, right, okay then. Um, Oh yeah, I've got a leak in my house, so I need to get that sorted. Your man said he might be able to come round tonight, which would be great. Um, right, okay, let's go through these questions. I'm dreading this, actually. Right, I, I haven't actually had a proper look at them, but um, I did laugh at some of them that were uh, that were put in there. My word. Right, okay, so let's start with... Well, it was on Twitter and Instagram um, that I asked... Uh, people to uh, get hold of us and um, and get their questions in. So that's where they're from. So first of all, we'll start with Twitter. Okay, so Twitter. First person on Twitter who asked me a question, Wes Hooker. Honestly, I've not looked at these, so let's see what he said. Um, if you could compete in the BTCC now, which team would you want to be with in which car and who would you want as a teammate? I get asked that a bit, actually. Um, but looking at it this year... I would probably say I'd be pretty useless in rear-wheel drive, to be honest. I'll be dead honest with you. Um, even though I do still think it'll be a rear-wheel drive car that wins the British Touring Car Championship, uh, I'd have to say which team and what car. Uh, I'd have to probably go with... My word. It'll be front-wheel drive car. And the best front-wheel drive car um, is a Honda FK8, I've got to say. Um, it's well-balanced uh, between... Um, Cataclean Halfords uh, Dynamics and BTC Racing um, with Swindon Engine in the um, in the BTC car and obviously the Halfords car running the Neil Brown Honda engine so two different engines but they look very equally matched um, but I'd have to say I think Josh Cook swings it for me because he's me bezzy um, so I think my teammate would be um, Josh Cook for show for show and I would go with BTC because he's there and it'd be the Honda FK8. So there you go, Wes. Question answered. <laughs> I was going to put my race overalls on for this and my helmet again, but my God, it's like 25 degrees here in the north, which we like. Um, Tracy Marsh. Hello, Tracy. Um, what safety ruling or gadget piece of equipment has made the most improvements for driver safety? Well, that's an interesting question, isn't it? I honestly haven't looked at these. If I'd have seen that, I'd have deleted it because I don't know. No, joking. Um, I think the biggest thing for me um, in the time I've been racing um, has made the most different is without doubt in tin tops, the hands device. And it's actually 
I've still got the same hands device that I bought off a friend of mine who was doing Formula BMW back in the day. So I got a hands device that's, um, God, is it? I still use it for coaching. Um, yeah, it's, I've got two actually. I've got a hybrid Simpson that um, Seb Perez gave me actually, um, who is a top lad, done a lot of Porsche racing and stuff. He gave me one of them, uh, which goes around. You'll see them. It looks like a baby carrier with um, with it going down the back as well. But I've got to say that the uh, the Simpson Hybrid or the or any any hands device in general, Shroff or whatever you've you've got, the the just the. I remember when they first come in and everyone hated them because you couldn't move your head. But the advancements have been made now, and you can actually move um, your head, and it and it stops you from. Um, hopefully getting a, a base skull fracture I think it is um, and it stops a lot of whiplash as well when we, we see huge accidents in British touring cars and when I first started racing in touring cars 2001 I had a massive accident actually in an egg car going up um, in 2002 this was the next year going up to Brands Hatches uh, turn two which is Druids and I uh, got turned around by Tim Harvey typical it's actually my fault to turn across the front of him battling uh, for third place or something and I hit the barrier so hard, and I remember I didn't have hands device on because they weren't mandatory and they did, they weren't made then. They didn't have them. Can't remember what year they come in. Maybe two thousand five or six. And then my head on the replay on the onboard, it actually hit the steering wheel because your neck stretches so far, um, and it's just horrible. So those advancements uh, from the hands device are just, without doubt, have made a massive difference. So I can't remember the the guys' names who um, who come up with that idea but the uh, head and neck restraint um, is just unbelievable so yes there you go Tracy it's unreal uh, Alistair McLeod I think it is I know Alistair actually I've met Alistair before and I'm sorry if I said your name wrong mate um, would you rather fight one Jason Plato sized duck or 20 duck sized Jason Platos <laughs> wait <laughs> what why is this even in here these have been filtered by my manager, Xmark. That just shows how good he is. Um, so yes, well, oh, that's a quite an odd one to answer because there'd be 20 big beaks on those things, wouldn't there? If there was 20 of them or one massive beak. I reckon I'd go for the big, the big, the big size Jason Plato. Yeah, because the one beak I could deal with, I couldn't deal with 20 of his beaks. It'd be a nightmare. Anyway, I hope you've uh, hope that's answered your question, mate. Took quite a lot of time on that, didn't I, really? Um, right, okay. Duncan Brown is asking, who do you think is, forward slash, was the best driver team combination there has been? Okay, so, okay. Uh, oh, driver team combination. Oh, I drive a team combination. Pfft. <sighs> There's been a lot of good ones, hasn't there? I think, I think we have to look at what Colin Turkington has done um, in the last. What has he been in it since? Nineteen years. And he's been in and out of touring cars, but he started two thousand and two, um, the same year I did. And I think it's got to be WSR, Colin Turkington, definitely. I think that answers it. Um, yeah. Unless someone overtakes the titles that he's won with BMW and WSR, I can't see it. You know, you look at Andy Rouse and his own team that did amazingly well in British touring cars. But no, I think I'm going to stick with um, I'm going to stick with with Colin, um, four-time champ, um, postman's just not on me door. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with him, and I'm going to go with uh, WSR as well because they do seem to win a lot of races together. I'm going to fire my uh, aircon up because I'm so hot. This was a bad move, man, sticking this a hoodie on. Don't know why I did that. I've got shorts on, though. I'm not showing you. Um, right, let's move on. Um, ba -ba 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 what else have we got? Okay, right. Uh, Morven Andrew Wood. Regarding incidents that happen during a race, do the stewards have access to extra cameras footage covering all cars to ensure driving standards or do they basically have the same pictures as us at home right that's why it's difficult as a commentator and a pundit to judge uh, incidents because basically in British touring cars cloud base and ITV have four I believe onboard cameras which they use for the television and um, then every car in the British touring car championship has its own um, 
camera that is a judicial camera so it's made sure that it's always working it can't be tampered with and it can't be this that and the other so that is a, from what I remember and I've been in the, the stewards office before it's it's facing out of the car but it's about here but you can see what they're doing with the pedals but you can see also what they're doing with them um, with the steering wheel and it's a Cosworth system or it runs off the Cosworth system which is the uh, the control electronics for British Towing Cars so everyone has the same so you can see from the potentiometer which measures the throttle measurement and the brake measurement and the steering input uh, and the what they call the yaw so that's the uh, the G sensor so going lateral um, G and also longitudinal so it knows if the car's going forward harder or backwards harder or sideways harder or what angle the car's in <clears throat> and it knows through all the controls all those inputs are put into the camera um, and you'll see sometimes one ITV run their onboard pole lap um, ow, is that funny though? Um, when they run the onboard pole lap you'll see all those different things where you can see a driver braking and driver throttling up so for instance if a driver's behind another one and they're pushing and they're on the power and you can see the driver in front sideways but they're still hard on the throttle by a certain percentage that they'll be done for um, um, driving into the driver in front and uh, an avoidable incident so to speak so yes um, they will use they will use ITV footage as well they'll use everything they've got they sometimes I believe ask for ITV's footage um, of outside cameras if they are struggling with what they've got themselves so ITV helped them and we uh, are helped by uh, Toka um, who are the uh, the controllers of British Touring Cars so we all help each other out very good question very good these are very good um, okay Caroline Caroline right don't know why I said that but anyway Caroline if there was a BTCC champion of champions championship of all time in brackets <laughs> who do you reckon would win <gasps> Ash Sutton. Mm -hmm. You could put him in a front wheel drive, a rear wheel drive, a middle drive, one wheel drive, near side front drive, rear drive, drive, drive me around the bend. Ash Sutton. Ash is very, very good. I think it'd be between him and like maybe someone from back in the day, I don't know. Andy Rouse, yeah. Yeah. It'd be good, wouldn't it? Throw John Cleland in the mix as well. Actually, we should just do it. They did it once at the end of 2004, I think, and they all had to see it Leon Coopers or something, and it was deadly. I remember watching it thinking, this is going to end in tragedy, but it didn't. It was a good race. I think Anthony Reid won it, actually. Well, he wasn't a touring car champion. They just put Matt. It was a Masters race. It wasn't a championship race. Um, do I have to try and get that footage from somewhere? It's classic, that is. I remember watching it. I watched it from Redgate Corner at Donington when the uh, touring cars had finished their very last weekend uh, race in 2004 and James Thompson won the championship I remember because we got smashed up <laughs> I wasn't racing back then um, Harry Adams I know he's a fan of the show uh, at Wookie Harry what a lad in your opinion what are the three best looking touring car liveries to have raced in the BTCC wow wow okay Nissan Primera RML I'm on my feet here on my toes because I haven't looked at these questions uh, Nissan Primera uh, from 99 John Cleland's 1995 Cavalier championship winning car proper retro that and I'd probably say I'm going to throw one in the mix I absolutely loved Aidan Moffitt's Laser Tools Racing A Class from a couple of years back I think that was awesome absolutely awesome so there's your three uh ellie bartley hello ellie uh this is the best question i have ever ever seen you are not going to believe this you ready for this snog marry avoid <laughs> steve Ryder, addison and tim harvey i love how you should put addison right i would always snog probably Tim Harvey, because I reckon he's a bit of a wrong gun, and you could have a night out with him and it'd just be a bit bit naughty, because he I know he is a wrong gun. <laughs> I'm joking, he's not. But I reckon he's a yeah, I reckon he is anyway. Offline that is, I don't know what he does behind closed doors, but I reckon he's a bit weird. Um 
I would get married to Steve Ryder because I know that he would be just a straight shooter and like he'd get me tea on the table and like iron me clothes immaculately and make sure I didn't go out the house with my hair like it is now um, and I'd just be proud of him as I walk down the street. Um, who would I avoid? Well that's just David Addison because I avoid him in real life. <laughs> that's not a joke. Uh, right, okay. Paul Turner at tall Paul Turner what's your best oh what's the best compliment you've ever had from a fellow BTCC driver um, okay yeah let's answer that one first because you've got a couple and um, the best compliment ever I've had this is this is so cool I love these question times Tom Onslow Cole was behind me once in a in a British touring car race in 2011 when I was in a Chevrolet cruise that just had a mind of its own we had weird dampers on the car um, and it was so hard to drive that year and it, I remember going to Brands GP and it was a bucking Bronco an amazing car the RML car but we just couldn't get to grips with these dampers that we had on the car and um, anyway I just had to send it every time I drove it it was proper hard work and uh, I remember me and Tom had the battle royale in the race and uh, for like fourth place or something it was and uh, he was trying to get down the inside of me at Sterling's which is a uh, third gear quite a high speed um, corner where it, it's it's the second to last corner at Brands GP so he'd seen everything out the back of me hanging onto it and I've had a massive slide and just slid it all the way up to the um, all the way up to the curb on the exit pulling for fourth and fifth and I remember Tom got the run because he was in a turbo focus um, that was um, an Aon car I think it was and his, Tom Chilton was his teammate and he'd come past me and you can't really see much because you're quite restricted but I remember looking because I thought I'll have to look where he is because he's on the outside for clearways and I just seen his little his little white gloves go <laughs> so he must have had the steering oh, held by his knees and we spoke about it. anyone ever sees Tom Onzo Cole you ask him about that because I remember him coming up to me and shaking my hand going mate fair play I don't know you've hung on to that so yeah he gave me a little clap in fifth gear but then he dropped back a bit so he must have been on the limiter because he's forgot to pull for sixth anyway that's what you do when you're, uh, you're, your mates are racing but the TV cameras never pick that stuff up it was brilliant um, natural follow up question from Paul Turner what's the worst thing a fellow BTCC driver has said about you oh that is interesting um Oh, um, oh, I think, oh, do you know what? The only person that's ever got really angry with me, um, because I only, I only ever had one, one hit on my license, three points for turning someone round at Silverstone, because I just, my mirror was bent in and I didn't mean, I just drove into him because I couldn't see when he, he lunged me. Um, it was Alan Morrison, who was a factory Honda driver in 2002. Uh, with Matt Neal and I and I got a brilliant start from the back of the grid at the Indy circuit and in the egg touring car triple eight car and I, I remember like you know when you hit the brakes and it's like oh no oh no and I just knew I was late and I tagged him so hard and he went backwards and I tried to we were looking at each other and he was just like I could see he was so angry so angry anyway the race finished and he finished behind me and he uh, yeah he wasn't very uh, complimentary uh, about me he said um he said, you <laughs> he said, you know F all about F in Nout. And uh, yeah, which was very nice. But uh, I was quite scared of him. He was quite a Larry character. Ask Matt Neal about Alan Morrison if you ever get a chance. Um <laughs> Motorsport Dude! It's my mate Nigel Pryor. Right, Nigel, do drivers prefer clockwise or anti-clockwise circuits? Do you know what? Uh, it's a good question that. Rockingham was an anti-clockwise circuit. And the only thing I ever remember about going to Rockingham, <clears throat> I loved Rockingham because I always did well there. The only thing I remember about Rockingham to tell you guys is when it's an anti-clockwise circuit, there's not a lot of downforce and massive amount of lateral grip that's going to hurt your neck because you're just so used to going around right-handers for the clockwise nature of the other circuits in the UK. Um, when you get to a clock anti-clockwise circuit, the first three practice hurts your neck a bit. But after that, it's it's you don't even think about it to be honest. That's just the you know you just get on with it and it's it's the way it is. So yeah, I didn't really ever think of it until your neck started to hurt a bit. You'd be like, what's going on here? But then you realised it was because you go around so many left-handers that you wouldn't usually do on uh, UK tracks. Um, good question though. Last no, it's not the last one from Twitter. Uh, Chris Willis, out of the current touring car drivers, 
Who would you not like to be stuck in a lift with and why? <laughs> God, what a question this is. I honestly haven't read these. Uh, oh, uh, Tom Oliphant, because <clears throat> he is so annoying and boring. Uh, God, he'd send me to sleep. Actually, I'd, be, I'd like to be stuck in a lift with him because I'd just let him talk to me in his monotone voice. The nerd. Um, yeah, oh my God, he's so boring. Um, Craig, <laughs> Craig Timmins, uh, give us an idea of costs. Are top drivers fully funded or bringing private sponsorship to the table? Okay, um, it ranges between, for touring cars, it'll be between some teams, not many of them, I think. I've lost touch a bit on costs, but uh, some, will, some will have to fund the drive for 300 grand. Some will have to fund it maybe for a bit less. Some teams will take the hit. Um, most drivers will have to come with six hundred thousand pounds. I would say that's probably the top top line of the top teams if you want to try and win the championship. Um, the drivers, <clears throat> I'd say eighty five percent of them have to bring their own money, um, whether that's family or sponsorship. Um, there's a couple, a few drivers out there uh, that don't bring any money at all, um, and they have a, a seat on their um, their actual skill, which I think is missing a lot in British touring cars but that's the way it is um, so yeah I mean there is only a few drivers I mean people like Tom Ingram Jason Plato um, Gordon Shedden they will bring the budget to the team and then whatever is left over is their wages to pay themselves um, they'll tell you that themselves so they are properly very clever businessmen and fantastic race drivers and are champions or will be in the future so yeah that's that's what that is all about um, just so you know I used to turn up at uh, just give you an example it was two hundred thousand pounds to run the Chevrolet cruise for tech speed in 2011 uh, go mobile and uh, go mobile paid for the running of the car which was two hundred thousand pounds sunshine.co.uk which was a good friend of mine Chris Brown and Claire Brown they paid for the car which was ninety thousand pounds I think from RML Jason Plato's ex touring car so you've got those two entities one sponsor owns the car one sponsor is paying for the uh, the running of the car and then I had personal sponsorship from people uh, like Fujifilm and a couple of other little sponsors that helped me out partners that helped me out and I'd either pay myself a couple of quid wages which never really ever happened and that's why I didn't bother racing anymore because you couldn't it was just too much hassle um, or that would go into the accident damage budget because you're going to have accidents in British touring cars, unfortunately. Uh, right, what else, what else, what else? Uh, compare this to the other categories, Porsche, Mini, JCW, etc. Do teams make a profit? Oh, right, okay. Right, okay. Teams only just make a profit. I would, this is weird. Um, yeah, operations like West Surrey and Dynamics, and I mean, everyone's been hit hard by the pandemic, I'm sure. Well, I know they have. Um, but yeah, teams struggle to make, you know, big, big money. Let's be honest, they're doing it for the love of the sport. Um, but at the same time, it's a business, so they have to make money, and that's the way it is. So yeah, um, touring cars, for me, Alan Gow gives the teams a fantastic platform, and he says, there's your ITV coverage, there's everything else. You crack on, you find your money, and uh, you find your drivers, and that's exactly what they do. So yeah, I mean, you can't ask for fairer than that. A lot of people... Um, have a bee in the bonnet about British touring cars um, you know it's not a, you know, can't make money out of it a bit like me I'm saying you can't do it well it's how bad you want to make money out of it and how bad you want to do it at the end of the day um, you know Goodyear as a sponsor are amazing uh, Quick Fit as well are involved so you know there's big brands there and um, it's supply and demand the grid's full so if you don't want to do it get out of it and that's what I did um, and now I'm answering Twitter and Instagram questions in my car mm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, I like that anyway. Anyway, but yeah, the support races, uh, the support teams, minis, uh, Porsches, all that, they they make they make money. Some of them probably make a bit more money than some of the touring car teams, I'll be dead honest. Um, yeah, which is interesting, isn't it? Anyway, Nikki, 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 um, has presenting given you a whole new perspective on motorsport? What a great question, Nikki. Yes, it has. It's given me... A massive new lease of life this is my 10th year for ITV this year um, and what has it done it has made me watch when you're driving yourself all you concentrate on is yourself 
that is it no one else matters no one else matters you don't care about anybody else it's you know not something that you will uh, let get away focus wise you won't focus on anyone else unless they are your direct rival and you need to know more about them so you kind of don't know what's going on everywhere else and um, whereas I actually know most things about most drivers and most cars because the teams and the drivers all want to speak to you because you're media so they will tell you everything so it has changed my perspective long story short definitely um, Gary Broughton or Broughton sorry Gary um, if you could you can tell I can't read very well mate um, if you could only race one formula forward slash category ever again and let's say anything from F1 to karting or racing wheelbarrows what would it be I love these questions this is wicked uh, if you could only race right okay so formula category I think if I was Aussie V8 done the wheelbarrows man there's no engines in them I'm, do I look like I could push a wheelbarrow around all day no, I couldn't do that. I'm not fit enough. Good question, though. Uh, Andrew Bayliss. Oh, this is a disaster. Why is this in? Andrew, no. <sighs> this is horrendous. Listen, I'm too honest to, um, to not answer this. What's the total tally of grid girls you've been out with? <laughs> I've been in touring cars for 20 years. So I'd say it was probably, probably knocking on 50, 55, something like that. I hope that answers your question, Andrew. Uh, Kristen Plant. Hello, Kristen. These names are funny because I just know all your names from Twitter. Uh, you play a lot of music in your car. <laughs> so favourite band forward slash song from the 80s, the 90s, 2000, 2010, 2020. Okay, 1980s. Uh, ooh. 1980s, be Deep Purple, um, Smoke on the Water, the 90s would be Sweet Harmony by The Beloved, 2000s will be, ooh, I'm going to say Northern Star by my sister, uh, 2010s, now you're asking, it's all a blur now, 2010s uh, be something by, oh god, you're asking now. I like a lot of R&B and rap music, so oh, I don't know actually, I don't know, um, Drake maybe, Drake, something like that, uh, and 2020s, what do I like at the minute, uh, I like Coldplay's new song actually, the, um, the quite upbeat lifting one, I don't even remember the name of it, anyway that one, um, that was good wasn't it, yes I'll say Coldplay, they're still going aren't they, they've been going 20 years, uh, plus favourite film soundtrack, oh my word. Do you want me to sing it? Okay, watch out. Take my breath away. Dee -dee, dee -dee. Take my breath. Anyway, that one, which is from Top Gun, I believe. Um, there's a beautician's that's across the road from me, and the girls are outside having a fag in uh, Widner Styley, and they're all laughing at me. So, anyway, right. Thank you for that, Kristen. You've absolutely uh, nailed me there, and yeah, right. Instagram. We got a few from Instagram. Uh, John, John Rowell, forty-five. Which track scared you the most in the BTCC? In bad weather or handling? I never did one more lap of Thruxton than I needed to do. I had. I remember I had a double podium there in, at Vauxhall. I smoked my teammate James Thompson. Overtook him twice in both the races in two thousand and three, and it put me second, I think, in the championship. Or maybe third, I'm not sure. But anyway, Muller won both races and I was behind him battling uh, with the Hondas. And I just never ever did one more race than I needed, uh, one more lap than I needed to do there. I was just always scared to death of having a puncher or going off. I just, I'm actually quite, I'm brave, but at the same time, I'm just, I just know the dangers of, of racing. Um, Thruxton is so many drivers' favourite circuits and it's, it's not mine, it just isn't. And it's nothing against the circuit, I just don't like to be scared. <laughs> But I've had like loads of podiums there, and even in the Integra, I'd, yeah, I did really well around there actually, which is weird, isn't it? Maybe I just took my brain out when um, when I get out of bed, when I when I went to the circuit. Um, but do you know what? Thruxton is actually you ask about bad weather or handling. Thruxton is actually easier in the wet, weirdly, because you, the car's not moving around as much. 
which is bizarre, and you're not going as fast, so you're not as scared. Uh, at J Fez Ez, I think, Fezes, uh, do BTCC drivers watch themselves on TV racing and get a buzz from it, or just ignore it, or are they critical of themselves? Right, there'll be two different types of drivers. I always watched my races back to see what I did with certain drivers and how I operated and you know, what maybe I said in interviews and stuff like that. Monica from next door, she's just walking the dog. Um, so yeah, I would say I watched it back just to be critical of myself and see what I could have done better and how other drivers, because I don't get to see what all the drivers are doing and how they defend from other drivers. So you always need the heads up. So yes, I do that. I know Ash Sutton does that. Ash Sutton listens to a lot of what the pundit says um, and a lot of the other drivers do as well. Some of them, don't even watch it back. I know Jason Plato gets on the gin and tonic as soon as he gets home from a racetrack and watches the whole show back. So he's, you know, I'd say the majority of them do. Maybe some of them don't because they're not really bothered, but uh, the majority do because it's homework. It really is. Maybe leave it to the next day. I used to. I never got home. I just I was working the next day usually, so I just went to bed and got up and went to the next track and went to work. Um, so that was a very good question. Uh, Lynn Murray 209 or 209. If you could create your ultimate track using sections of existing tracks, which corners, straights would you use? What a great question. I love that. Um, okay, I would say, love Paddock Hill Bend, so that's one. Uh, love Druids at Alton Park, that's another. Um, love Island Bend at Alton Park, that's another. I love the Chicane at Knock Hill, that's definitely in there. Hawthorns at Brands Hatch GP. Um, where else is a real quirky corner? Um, I actually really like the hairpin at Croft. <laughs> We've got a circuit yet. Um, yeah, there's always a favourite corner at each track that you go to. Um, the bomb holes are classic, and Corum as well, they're favourites of mine. Uh, what else? Is there any others? So many, we're so lucky in the UK, you know, because we have such fantastic race circuits. You go to places like America and that, and they, sh I mean, they're great, it's a big place and it's got a lot of circuits, but we just have such characterful circuits and they're just mega. Um, yeah, I like the straight actually at Brands Hatch, because it's not really a straight, it's a kink, isn't it? Um, and yeah, and going up to, it's quite iconic when you come out of the last corner at Snetterton and go up uh, up the straight there as well. It's it's pretty special. So yeah, lots of corners, lots of circuits involved in that one. Um, so yes, that is awesome. Um, who is the most famous driver you have done coaching with? Melanie C. It's my sister. She is the best and most famous person I have ever, ever coached. Um, she was supposed to be on Top Gear a few years ago when it was starving a reasonably, reasonably priced car. And we went to Bedford Aerodrome. I should shut that because that was the last question. Thank you for that, sorry, Dave. Oh, it's the Zeus Meister, it's Dave. Um, that was the last question. Um, so yeah, I took my sister to Bedford and we um, I paid a couple of quid to, I was working there at the time, to one of my friends who was the boss there, Phil Ellis, give him some money for the track rental for an hour. And uh, we got a rental car and we just drove around because my sister's never driven a, a H-Batten gearbox and that's what she needed to do. Um, and in the end, she didn't actually do it. She had to pull out and go and, go and do a proper job and go and sing to people. Um, so yeah, she will be the most famous person I think I've had in the car. I've had John Bishop in a car as well. What an absolute legend of a guy he is, loving to bits. Um, and I've had quite a few famous people, but Armel is definitely the most famous person and the nicest as well. And my God, she was shocking, awful. I have never been so scared in the car. She was terrible, like proper. It's like, it like sitting with John George, my old teammate. Actually, no, she was better than him. He was horrendous. I'm joking, John's a good lad, but he wasn't very good. He flies planes, which scares me a lot. Right, those questions were absolutely awesome. Thank you so very, very, very much. I think it's time to try and get hold of the Jake Sanson. Hello, mate. Hello, Jakey Sanson. Oh, can I hardly hear you, hang on. Oh, Hello again. There we uh, go. Is that any better? That's better, mate. What's going on, fella? Have you been, uh, you been messing with your microphone? <laughs> 
Something like that. Oh mate, that yeah that went that went really quiet then. Right. We are filming <laughs> we are filming my man live from my car, sat on my drive. Um yeah. and it's so hot mate at the minute. I don't think it's gonna be like that at brands, but um anyway right. anyway Jake Sanson, thank you for joining us. Um you're from Downforce Radio and Downforce Radio is it's on another level at the minute, mate. What's going on there? We're certainly getting there, aren't we? Yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me onto your show, first of all. I mean, I know you have motor racing royalty on your program, so <laughs> to be part of that is pretty bloody fantastic, really. So, yeah, thanks for that, first of all. Um, yeah, so the Downforce Radio thing, uh, it was an idea that I kind of had a long time ago as a teenager watching the sport of touring cars and Formula One and rallying and everything. And I thought, you know, there's no radio station about cars and about mm. racing and i kind of thought well there kind of needs to be because mm. it's still a very valuable format i think i think radio is still quite an important tool for broadcasting in various different methods and it's been something i've been trying to put together for a long time i started it as a podcast in 2012 once a month and then a few like-minded journalists said this isn't a bad idea mate we should probably try and make this into something mm. so we slowly grew it and grew it we did some live commentaries on various events at the side of the track at snetterton and croft and donnington and i think even when you came and had a play the masters we were there mate so <laughs> we've, been, we've been pretty much everywhere over the last few years and um my good friend george grant decided that it needed to be bigger so uh, he's uh, basically got involved in the company with me taking it over mm. and uh, now we are 24 7 motorsport and car radio station which is quite an incredible achievement mm -hmm. in such a short space and time uh, we've already had 25,000 listeners and we've been operating since the middle of April mm -hmm. um, and it's all been word of mouth it's all been on social media that we've been promoting it and hopefully getting a few like-minded people who like the sport to come in and host some shows and create some content and just grow it as a community it's very much a community project and mm -hmm. it's going beautifully yeah no it seems to be I, you know this is in association with downforce which is fantastic the driveway to hell and that that's not one of the reasons you're on here by the way and you know i was always honest we we spoke didn't we because we we have a show on downforce called the undercut which people have, we do they've got to watch that i mean if you haven't seen it you've got to see it me and jake uh, just <laughs> chatting about british touring cars but also other tin top championships in in the national uh, arena but mostly toka yeah um but there's, there's a lot going on isn't there and it's um it's it does need something like that doesn't it because i feel like I, I feel like i've hit a bit of a niche with the fans because you know this idea of me sat in a car talking about touring cars i was just like i did a pilot mm. but it seems to have took off and i think there is that that appetite isn't there for for you know something like downforce and also just anything most but people just want to listen about most but it's a it's a it's a big business they do and i think the thing is as well is that people can't get enough of it mm. you know they, there's one championship on the Toka package, which everybody's crazy for, which is the British Touring Car Championship. But mm. as you say, you know, there are five other formulas and there are drivers that people are shouting for and cheering on, you know, in the Formula 4s and the Genetta Super Cup, in the Juniors, mm. in the Minis, uh, and of course in the Porsches. And then you go to other paddocks and there are other things that people are crazy about, like the Fun Cup, like the Mazda Super Cup, mm. uh, the City Car Cup, where you've got Citroen C1s racing around the circuit at 70 miles an hour. There's so much going on <laughs> in the sport that's brilliant, that everybody, you know, should know about. Mm -hmm. And it's only really been in the past on the onus of the clubs to promote it. And there's only so much that people can do. Mm -hmm. uh, day in day out when they're already trying to organize the championships and I felt well there needs to be somebody out there who takes the onus on themselves to promote the sport and figure out what it is that's actually happening what's going on make it entertaining for people to listen to celebrate what's been good about the sport over the last 120 years it's been going mm -hmm. and where it's headed in the future and you know all it's taken essentially is like-minded people to agree with what I think is a very simple concept and come aboard and make it happen and we're still growing there's still room for people to come in and get involved yeah no I love it mate love it and uh, when I can I do listen in and it's good because you've got Mike Reed on there as well and I do love the tunes mate the old school tunes man <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's absolutely full of them he's absolutely full of them I mean that man is a walking talking jukebox <laughs> and he is absolutely full of a plethora of knowledge about the music industry he is a bit of a, a closet car nut as well. He does love his old Jags. He loves his old uh, Bentleys and things. And he's actually got really, really interested in the sport again uh -huh. uh, since getting involved. But no, his breakfast show is fantastic. Every morning, 7 a.m. till 10 a.m. 10 and it's for those people who love a little bit of retro 
uh, love some vintage tunes and just love a bit of banter in the morning over their sausage and egg muffin. You know, it's, it's a really, really good laugh. <laughs> and uh, it's a brilliant show and it's growing in popularity and people really do seem to still love Mike, which is wonderful. Yeah. 73 and still going strong. He sounds like he's in his 40s. I know. It's bonkers. I don't know where he gets his energy from. It can't just be the cup of tea. <laughs> all, all, all these older guys like Steve Ryder and that, they just like, they are full on Benjamin Button spec, aren't they? They're getting younger. And I feel like I'm going to, there's going to be one time I go to work and Steve will be my age. <laughs> do, do you know, I was just going to say, do you know what? I've been watching Steve Ryder since I was a kid. And I swear there's a painting in his attic that keeps changing. You know, that man just doesn't age. He's just as good as he was in the 90s. And he just doesn't age at all. Yeah. It's wonderful. I know. And I love it because he's still got... He's still got a massive appetite for it, and he's still it still gets him out of bed in the morning. I think that's uh, it does, yeah. I, I think we're all like that, you know. We all love it for the same reason. It still gives us that spine chilling nerve ending that kind of makes us, you know, want to be there at the side of the track. And I've I've said this about many different things with racing, whether it's Lewis Hamilton at the Grand Prix, whether it's you know Joe Forte in a Mazda at the side of a racetrack at Knock Hill or wherever, or if it's uh, Joe Bloggs in a go kart, or mm -hmm. even, you know, even Dave on a lawnmower in the middle of Whisper Green. <laughs> you know, when that light is about to go out, when that flag is about to drop, the emotion is the same. Yeah. It's exactly the same. So that adrenaline rush is identical for every driver in every category. So why treat them differently? Yeah. They're all as brilliant as each other. Yeah. Uh, do you know what? That's really well put, actually, because I've driven all sorts of stuff, Gersten Downs in a Formula Ford, and exactly the same mm. feeling of when the light is on red, ready for it to go out, is exactly... There's yeah. no, there's, I don't feel any more nervous or any less nervous in a in a British touring car race on, on a reverse yeah. pole or something. It's the exact same feeling, so... And you've still got to concentrate the same amount. You know, you've mm. still got to give that same focus to it because if you're just even a little bit uh, distracted or out of focus, the worst things can go wrong. Mm. So you've got to give your full attention to it. It doesn't matter what you're racing. You've mm. still got to put absolutely everything into it. Mm. No, dead right, dead right. Um, right, on that note then, British Touring Cars, let's review Snetterton is 60 seconds. So we had a pole from Turkington converted into a win in race one. Then we had a Sutton plow through the field uh, to win race two from the, uh, from the teens. And then we had Tom Ingram taking Hyundai and Accelerate's first win. What did you make of it all, Captain? All good? I have to say, I'm hoping this is kind of what we're going to get for the rest of the season now, because it does seem as though these three, these are going to be the big hitters, Turkington, Ingram, Sutton. They genuinely do look like they're going to be the ones gunning for the title, with a little bit of a knock on the door from Josh Cook and Jake Hill, mm. because they do seem to have good consistency. Uh, over the course of these three races now, Turkington, Ingram, Sutton, they are like the three big players. Everybody else is kind of knocking for scrapes. Mm. And I really do like the attitude that both uh, Turkington and Sutton have had about the new challenge that they're getting. Because, uh, I mean, they've had a few drivers looking in every now and then in the last two seasons, but it's all been about those two. It's all been about mm. Turkington and Sutton. And it's like the entire Toka paddock has been waiting for Tom Ingram to really mount a title attack. I thought it was going to be 2019 already, mm -hmm. and he came close. Mm -hmm. He came very close. Last year, obviously, being a bit, you know, it was a little bit of a hiccup, wasn't it? But now we're into a proper touring car season, and he's in a car that he feels good with. He actually said, when I spoke to him about it at Thruxton, you know, this car actually feels more drivable and more adaptable than the Toyota ever did, mm. which is a really encouraging sign. So now I think Tom is actually in his flow. Mm. He's got a, a good team around him. He's obviously got, you know, his race engineer has come with him and the two of them are chalk and cheese. Mm -hmm. So he's in a very comfortable position. I think this could be Ingram's best chance of a title attack. And if Sutton and Turkington aren't careful, mm. those two are going to be completely hoodwinked Mm. by Tom because Tom's really got his dander up he's fighting for every corner he's got good pace in the middle of the race he's really good at bringing the tyres on to come alive at the latter parts of races mm. and look at Snetterton you know first second and fourth he was easily the most consistent driver out there mm. so it's really interesting to see that I think he's a I think he's a championship gamesman this year mm. I think he can make a push for it yeah and you know as well it's interesting we speak about Tom Ingram because I was one of the one of the people who said he will go well and accelerate will up their game but i honestly and i don't mind you know writing wrongs i honestly did mm. not think he'd be as fast as he has been but do we go to do we go now to brands hatch and it's another 
you know, curve ball thrown at them and they have to learn the car again because the circuit's a bit different? Um, or have enough questions been asked and answered by going to two of the most different circuits ever, Thruxton and Snet? So they just pitch up at brands and they go again, don't they? It's a really good question. Uh, I would say yes and no. Uh, mm. I think that, you know, in, in a similar manner to what you've already described, you know, with Snetherton and Thruxton being so different to each other, we've seen that the car is quite adaptable. It was able to score podiums on both occasions, so that's good. There was a little blip towards the end of Thruxton. Yeah. So there might be a little bit of hesitation going to brands. There might be a little bit. What they do have uh, on their side is that you know the, the amalgamation between accelerate and trade price cars i think was actually a really really good uh, amalgamation i actually used to work uh, for trade price cars back in the day on their social media i know it's okay. now uh, zach who does it and he's a fabulous fabulous chap yeah. uh, but he and dan kirby and the whole team they are absolute leviathans you know they leave no stone unturned mm -hmm. in their quest to build up and they were a rookie team you know three four seasons ago and everyone was like, well, who the hell do these guys think they are? You know, they're not going to challenge the established guard. But they did. You know, they did in their first season. And they were doing great with Jake pretty much right from the start. Mm -hmm. And now they've been able to come in and be an established force. And they're really doing strong. And it's not just there. It's not just a flash in the pan. They're also doing well in TCR. Dan Kirby last week mm -hmm. uh, managed to get his first TCR UK win. So, you know, they're really starting now as an entire motorsport outfit, as an operation, mm. to really grow and expand on their program. Mm. So I don't think this is a, a flash in the pan for them at all. I think this is the establishment of a big team within the sport. We've seen it a couple of times uh, when teams have come in for the first time. We saw it when Triple Eight started. Everyone was kind of dubious and thinking, you know, a team run by Derek Warwick. What does he know about Derek Gus? Yeah. But he knew everything. He, he knew exactly what to get done. You know, they, they went and did their homework and they've come away as one of the most successful teams in the business. I think this is just the 21st century equivalent mm. of that new driving force. There's a couple of teams like that. And I think Tom's got the right people around him to continue to develop. I still don't think we've seen the best from him yet. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, would, I would agree with that because, and it was well put what you've just said, because even Dan Kirby winning in TCR UK at the weekend, he, he won that race exactly how he runs his team. It was very under the radar and you would just pretty yeah. much forget. It's like he's not trying to be under the radar. They're just not arrogant. <laughs> Yeah. That's a very good point. Yeah, they just get on with it. And uh, that was what he was like as a boss to work for. You know, he's never he's never claimed himself to be, you know, anything other than he is. He's a absolutely passionate man who loves the sport, wants to be part of it, just wants to play and enjoy his playtime. But he wants to work hard for it. He doesn't want things to be handed to him. So he has built the team up from nothing, literally nothing, to now be one of the established teams in the British Touring Car Championship mm -hmm. in the space of five years which is absolutely phenomenal i mean in this day and age that sounds almost impossible to do mm. so the fact that they've been able to do it with clever marketing clever strategy uh, a can-do attitude uh, it, it's wonderful there are a few teams like that i mean who would have thought btc racing as well would just come straight out of the blocks this year and be race winners multiple times mm. you know they, they were good last year mm. they were solid but to come fresh out of the blocks and win the first two races, I think that's taken quite a few people by surprise mm. in a very pleasant way. Mm. And it is great. You know, yeah. It's great that we're seeing some new teams hit the front mm. and hit the front regularly. It's not just about the dynamics, the West Surreys, you know, the, the, the teams that are always towards the sharp end. It's nice to see that we've got some new teams really having a crack at it. Mm. And do you know what's really nice about those two teams you mentioned, BTC, uh, Trade Price, Cars and Accelerate? They haven't come in and flashed their cash straight away. No. All they've done is they've, they've gone in at the lower level, they've they've done their apprenticeship and they've, they've learned the trade and now they know it's time for them to start pushing on and competing properly for, for championships, haven't they? It's such a good point because, you know, I think in, in very much in British touring cars, more than anywhere else, the adage Rome wasn't built in a day. Yeah. It's such a good point. You know, you can't just come in like Braun would have done in F1 or, you know, Toyota would have done at Le Mans and just, you know, spend all the money and go, bang, we've got it. We've got it done. In touring cars, so much happens mm. over the course of a season and there's so many variables. It changes every weekend. It changes every lap from time to time. Mm. And 
with these guys, you really got to do the homework. And I've always said this about racing teams in any form of motorsport. You learn 10 times more from losing a race than you do from winning it. Yeah. Winning it is the reward for the hard work, but you've got to do the grunt work before you can taste victory. And these sort of teams, the BTCs, the, the, the trade price cars, there are a few other teams in that mix as well, actually. If you look through the grid, there are a few of them that are really starting to get their act together now. So even to a certain extent, Adrian Flux with Powermax, you know, they were sort of here, there and everywhere last year, but they're slowly starting to look like they could get podiums again. Snetterton, perhaps a bit of a hiccup. Um, but then you look at even, you know, Sicily with Adam Morgan, they're starting to get back up to some speed again. It's going to take them a bit of time to establish it, mm. but they are getting there. And it's it's not it's not a complete malnoma. I mean, uh, MB Motorsport, mm-hmm. to the fact that they were on the podium three times in Bruxton. Mm-hmm. And that is, it's not a new team, but it's kind of a new adaptation of what the team was to start with. So they've kind of had to completely rebrand and go again. And... You know, Mark is there. Mark Blundell is really passionate about it. He wants to go into this new phase of his career. He's obviously stopped being a driver, and now this is his new challenge. Yeah. And he's not taking any prisoners. You know, he's pulling punches. He's really giving it a good go. Mm-hmm. And it's wonderful to see that, you know, slowly they are taking prisoners. They are taking names. Yeah. But as you say, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. They are going to have to do the homework. But it, what's lovely is that the team these teams are you know so prepared to give it a go yeah and that's exactly it isn't it and it does remind me of nascar quite a lot now british touring cars where every team really does have a chance and uh and there's a lot of you know different um things that are going on with tires and weight and the drivers are actually i think every driver on the grid really uh you can't there's not many drivers on that grid that you can actually say nah they will never ever win a race in their entire life yeah. if they were there for 20 years and that that says a lot about the british touring cars because i've been in it a long time and i've you know mm. competed in it and and i know for a fact that over the years there has been people who had no chance of yeah. ever winning a race that's fair i mean yeah. it's a good point i mean take a look at the likes of you know jessica hawkins mm-hmm. and jade edwards for example now a few years ago if you'd have said you know we're going to put a woman driver in the British Touring Car Championship, a lot of people would have seen that as a gimmick. Yeah. And we've kind of seen it as well. You just kind of, it, it's like token feminism to put them in the car, necessarily. And that's a term I hate, anyway. Yeah. Not just in racing, but in general. Mm. You know, when you talk about token feminism, anybody who uses that phrase, token feminism, clearly doesn't want women to succeed. Yeah. Because it's like a get out clause almost. Mm-hmm. But if you look at people like Jade and Jessica, the work they've done yeah. to put themselves in that position where they can be good enough to race at the British Touring Cars. Again, you know, it's not a gimmick. They've not just been handed everything. They've really had to do the grunt work. And they've gone away and done an incredible amount of self-development, excessive fitness training. They've rebuilt themselves after things have gone wrong in certain ways. And they have completely adapted to the challenge. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful. It's the first time in 20 years that we've had two women on the grid at the same time. Mm -hmm. And both of them have earned the right to be there. It's not just because, oh, well, they're a girl. No, it's because they've genuinely dug deep and gone and done their work Mm -hmm. and earned their right to be on the starting grid. Mm -hmm. We're in an era where the touring cars is actually one of the most diverse grids out there. I mean, you've got to look at some of the other drivers that uh, are meeting the challenge. I mean, look at Nick Hamilton. Yeah. You know, Nick Hamilton, as a, as a great example, you know, who would have thought that a racing driver on the grid in the British touring cars with cerebral palsy I know. would be up at, towards the sharp end? He's within a second of the leaders half the time in yeah. qualifying. That's phenomenal. Mm. And I was there at his first major car race commentating on it for Eurosport back in 2013 when he was doing European Renault Clio Cup and he was a good three to four seconds at times off the pace how he's done that in eight years Mm. to go from three seconds off the pace which is very impressive in itself to then be within a second of pole regularly at the touring cars Mm. that's superhuman it it is there's no two ways about it that's superhuman Mm. it is and i I think that people just people just forget that the the lad couldn't walk not that long ago you know he was in a wheelchair and it it, yeah it just flabbergasts me I, i don't hear so much now about the online you know uh, trolling too much of people uh, I don't want to no, it's good. massively but you know he just he just gets on with it and, I, and he's such a you know we both know him and we've both met him and spoken to him but honestly this yeah it's a lovely chat the stuff that he does for people is and that's what annoys me because if these people really seen what he did it's not just about turning a steering wheel pushing some pedals the, the, the bigger picture for that lad is amazing and he's such an inspiration to a lot of people that I've 
brought to touring cars um, when he first yeah. started, and they've met him, and he, he'll spend half an hour with them who have they've got the same condition. And I just he think, will, and and no. the amount of people as well who assume that because he is Lewis's brother, yeah. You know, he's been able to do it all just because his brother is who he is. The amount of times, and I know this for a fact, having spoken to him, having spoke to his dad, uh, you know, there have been times when Lewis has said, look, mate, I'm in this position I'm in. Mm. Let me help. Let me step in. Let me let me get you on that starting grid. And Nicholas has always had the same attitude every time. He's always said, thank you. Love the gesture. Love the ability to be to just step in and help. Mm but I've got to do this on my own. This is my challenge. I've got to do this on my own. He has refused help from his brother mm. who could pay for his season yeah. without even batting an eyelid, you right. know, without even having an issue. Yeah. And Nicholas's attitude has always been, no, I've got to do this on my own. Mm. I can't accept a handout mm. as much as I love you and you're my brother. I've got to do this by myself. Mm. And his attitude, his just pure determination. I don't know what there is in the water in Stevenage, but they churn out brilliant <laughs> racing drivers like there's no tomorrow. And I love Nicholas's attitude. He's just so tigerish. Mm. You know, the man just doesn't do defeat. He doesn't do dejection. He just gets on with it and finds another way. Mm. And if you could look at anybody in the sport and say, I can't do it. I mean, Nicholas and Billy Munger, they are two of the prime examples of people who just do not let a difficult situation get the better of them. Mm. And it's wonderful. Yeah, it really is, isn't it? It's, it is astounding. I, I just can't get my breath sometimes, you know, how he does it and and, mm. and how people react to it. But um, yeah, that's mm. that's how people are. And, uh, and it's just great to see him keep coming back and doing the business. So I absolutely love it. And it'll be a sad day when he isn't in, on the grid. Um, like some I agree. really good guys as well. Um, and girls, obviously. Uh, right, okay. So going on to brands then, Jake. Um, we were mm. talking about, um, you know, making the foundations and doing this and that and the other. I upset a couple of people, I think, uh, at the end of the ITV coverage. And one of them would have been Ash Sutton uh, when I was, I mentioned that it was a bit questionable. And I didn't mean they were cheating. I just was saying it was a bit, mm. it would be, there would be questions asked if that car wouldn't have finished second and it finished third on that reverse grid uh, going forwards with all the weight um, yeah. and a medium tyre against an FK at Honda with a soft tyre of Gordon Shedden, three-time champion. But I spoke to Ash yeah. just bouncing around on, on, uh, on WhatsApp and he said, I think what people forget is that we all we do is test with absolute maximum ballast and that is because we yeah. need to know where we're going to be. And, they really have got the run, haven't they? And I tell you what, take this. Let's talk about brands. I, I, if it rains, which it really can do at Brands Hatch, I would not mm. be surprised to see that lad put that thing on pole with full ballast. I agree. I absolutely agree. And people keep on, you know, nattering about Ash as a driver. Said, so, yeah, he's a great driver, but are they doing something they shouldn't be doing for him to be as phenomenally quick as he is? Let me tell you, not even close, no. not even close. I mean, Ash has always had that natural ability. I've watched him in various different categories through the years. And if anybody has any doubt at all as to just how talented Ash Sutton is, mm. I urge you to go to YouTube and find the <laughs> IAMI International Finals 2019 from Le Mans, which is karting. Now, this is just after he'd won you know, his first title in 2017. And he decided at uh, the request of uh, I am a UK, the engine builders, to go and have a play at Le Mans. So I'm there on the Tuesday afternoon setting up with my colleague Guillaume Alvarez and we see Ash Sutton in the entry list. I went, <laughs> hang on a minute, Guillaume Alvarez isn't going to know who that is. That's a British touring car driver. I went, can't be that Ash Sutton. Seriously, <laughs> it can't be that one. So he went over to the holding area and I went, oh, blimey, it is. So I said, Ash, what are you doing here? He said, oh, yeah, I just got a call from uh, Millsy. Uh, he just said, well, come and uh, race uh, in the shifter category. I looked and went, have you ever driven a shifter category car before? He went, no. <laughs> and, went, and you're going to just enter the world championship like that? Went, yeah. Went, All right, well, fair enough. Enjoy. Have a good one. He won the whole thing. Oh. I'm not joking. Li literally, he had gone from being about 20th out of the 27 drivers in first practice. And then over the three, four days leading up to the final, he worked his way through the pack steadily, slowly. He made up three, four places here, three, four places there. Started the final at about eight, I think. Yeah. And he won the whole thing. 
<laughs> that, that's that's phenomenal. Formula One drivers regularly return to shifter karting because it is the most physical discipline of training you can have. You're a couple of millimeters off the ground. Nought to sixty is the same as a Veyron can do. <laughs> and you are just millimeters off the ground. You're not strapped in. You can get thrown in and thrown into a tire barrier if you have an accident. So it's the most intense and physical discipline. I can't I can't picture any other driver who could literally come in as a novice and go and win the world championship in five days. Mm. That's how good Ash Sutton is. People looking at him in touring cars thinking he must be doing something dodgy. Mm. No, he genuinely is mm. one of the best drivers Britain's ever produced, never mind in the last 20 years. Mm. I mean, the guy's talent is just phenomenal. Mm. I think the British Touring Car Championship is very, very lucky to have a driver of that caliber. If you put him into a Le Mans team, he could go and win that mm. in a year. He could win them all. He could win Indianapolis. You know, he's got single seater experience. He could go win the Indy 500. If he'd had the money at the right time, he could have been in the Formula One grid. Mm. Could easily have been done. Mm. He's got that kind of talent. Mm. You don't win a gearbox category as a novice if you if you can't have that kind of ability. Mm. I so think, I, think, I genuinely think he's that kind of class. Yeah, I, I, I'm rightly with you. You know, I think he is. I think we are seeing a phenomenon of our time with Ash Sutton. Mm. I just think that we, we, because it's British touring cars, we just, we can't deal with the fact that, because we're just, we have it drummed into us that if you have weight, you're slower. But Jake Hill's shown that at Snetterton. It, it doesn't have yeah. to be the case. It's, if you're good, then you can outperform the car sometimes. And Ash is, Ash is the current British touring car champion in arguably the best car on the grid. And he is, it's not arguable. I think he is the best driver on the grid. So I do. Yeah. It, it I is, do. It, you're I dead agree. right. We're dead lucky, and and I think we should, I think we should just respect him a bit more. But as I say, I had to speak to him about it because I felt bad that he, you know, I, I, he, he thought that I was having a go, which I wasn't. Mm. Ash being Ash was just laughing. He was like, "Mate, it is what it is." Yeah. And Ash is not. Now, what I love either. about it, what I, what I love about it now, mate, is that we've got Ash as the reigning champion, Colin as a four-time champion. Mm desperately trying to get the fifth both packages the infinity and the bmw are lightning quick yeah. they both have good balance they both have good qualifying pace they both have tenacity behind the wheel and both of them are willing to get up and go for it mm. this could be one of the tightest battles for a title we've had for years yeah. and if you throw ingram into that mix as well mm. i mean this this could be up there with 92 yeah. you know this really could be up there with the likes of harvey soper cleland it could get that intense it could get that physical mm. i i think you're right because i think that i think colin um, who also is mega round brands and is like you say a four time champion I think um, you know BMW and WSR have actually they for me they have closed a bit of a gap that, that, in, that the Infinity and, and Ash Sutton had so I think it could be Battle Royale actually it, uh, it depends if it's wet I think the Infinity will be a lot better because we've seen it is better in wet weather than the BMW and they have closed the gap but I'm not too sure by how much mm. I honestly think that Tom Ingram as we go there with the second heaviest car I think if it's wet, he could be the real spanner in the works. I think he could, mm. you know, he kind of just pedals the car around. And and then you've got Jake Hill as well. And like you say, Cookie, all in the mix there. I think they're the ones who we need to be looking at um, as the weight yeah. drops off the car down down the order. Um, Adam Morgan as well. Morgan. We've yeah, I was just going to mention Adam Morgan because he's going to have a light car. Yeah. And you know what he's like when there's a little bit of rain. Mm. So Morgan could get a win or maybe even two. Yeah. at the weekend that is not a slow car he's driving you know that's the Sicily BMW mm -hmm. so he's got a good chance he's had a bad, bit of bad luck mm -hmm. but Morgan could win it at least two races over the weekend if they get it right on Saturday mm -hmm. he's definitely a dark horse he's one to keep an eye on yeah what, do you, we've spoken about Chilton before but it just is not happening for him Tom has had a lot of pole positions because he is so quick over over one lap but he's had them in particular around Brands Hatch. This for me mm -hmm. is make or break for him. He it needs to be um it needs to be this weekend for him to make the break because the the races are just flowing past us, aren't they? And they're just going from one thing to the other. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And the thing is, you know, this is the opportunity for him to show that he still has what it takes. I mean he's up against some younger whippersnappers, but he's up against the older established guard as well. So he's up against people like Plato and Shedden 
who are still able to be at that sharp end. You know, mm-hmm. Plato and Shedden both have a podium this year now, so they've obviously proven, you know, when the chips are down, they can deliver. Mm-hmm. For Chilton, this is actually quite a critical weekend because the younger kids are obviously still taking their bullets. Turkington is still on top. Yeah. Um, but Chilton isn't really there. He's mm-hmm. been conspicuous by his absence, yeah. which is quite a worry because Chilton is not a slow racing driver. And he's never been a slow racing driver. He's flat out or park it and go home. Yeah. So it's one of those situations where essentially when you come away with the first six races of the British Touring Car Championship with two points, something is really badly wrong. And Tom needs to make sure that it's not with him that's the biggest key that's the biggest key factor so he's got to try and throw caution to the winds on saturday this could be one of the most critical qualifying sessions that he's ever going to have mm. it's very true mate very very true and you're dead right there's going to be a lot of people looking now because they'll see that as one of the top drives and and uh, you know what touring car people are like and fans will be questioning you know even a chilton will, will be questioned so it will yeah. be interesting. Um, do you know who I've got here for a reverse grid win? And they need, they. I think they've got, I think they've really got it in them. And I've got a really strange Go feeling that Jack Goff is going to have an absolute belter of a weekend. I don't know why, whether it's wet or dry, yeah. or I just think he might get something in the reverse grid because they deserve it. Because he's actually been, he's actually been going well there. He's been getting points every round, more or less. Yeah, I was just going to say, good choice, because he is one of, I think, only three drivers this year that has scored points in every round. Yeah. And the only other two are Sutton and Turkington. So that is quite an incredible feat. And you've got a good point. Jack Goff has always been there or thereabouts. And he's been another under the radar, hasn't he? I mean, he's been there. And if anything is going to happen, he's going to be one of those who can benefit from it. Yeah. But he genuinely has a realistic chance of being on a podium at least once this weekend. Mm. But yeah, if the reverse grid pole comes to him, Jack's got a great chance. We know how tough it is to overtake at Brand. Yeah. Uh, but it's also about being, you know, really controlled. You know, you have to have nerves of steel, especially in the wet of the Indy circuit, because one slight mistake, one trip onto that curb, mm. one little blip of the throttle in the wrong place and that car's going to swap ends. Yeah. And Jack is one of those people that's really good at adapting to changeable conditions. Mm. We've seen some of his best drives in tricky circumstances that have caught out some of the best. Mm-hmm. So Jack is definitely a dark horse for that. Mm. Hey, tell you what was tell you what's interesting. Um, I spoke to Tony Gillam at the weekend. I was at Brands Hatch uh, covering mm. another Tin Top Championship. And it was very interesting what he was telling me because he i said to him exactly what i just said to you about the coopers and he said well we see ash's data because they they have a uh, an association with with laser tools racing um so they know where they are with that car against a rear wheel drive car and they they reckon they're on it they reckon they're on it they've just been out of position mm-hmm. um and i would i would agree with you on that that i think we're going to see something from jack but i think it'll be more towards no weight soft tire or reverse grid mm. um, and changeable conditions but they will they're definitely getting there and they're above some good people um other other, yeah. other people to talk about i think shedden has just had one of the worst starts to a year i think i have ever seen um for someone mm. of his caliber um i mean he's going to be up the front again but it's just whether or not he has a he has a terrible weekend but Plato needs to come back in the mix mm. as well, doesn't he? And Cook, but they're not. Far, it, they're actually not that far off, are they? Because they had such good opening rounds, they're not far off. Yeah, it's a very good point about Shedden. Actually, I spent a couple of years watching him in the FIA World Touring Car Cup. That was meant to be his big chance yeah. to go and be like Prio, and mm. I think he felt that it was all just going to come to him in the way that you know he'd won the British Touring Car Championships. So solidly and so smoothly you know everything had gone according to plan he'd never really had to worry about whether the car was going to be competitive enough Mm -hmm. it was always there or thereabouts and jumping straight into the world cup Mm. it's such a big change it's such a big difference in the british touring car championship you mess up the qualifying you will be so far back on the grid because everything is so close in the world cup you actually really have to work quite hard to maximize the best out of the car in qualifying Mm. and the thing about the modern BTCC and certainly TCR at that rate, it, it's so similar to karting's qualifying sessions mm. in the sense that if you mess it up even slightly, you're going to be starting 20 places further back than you should be. It's just so brutal mm. and it's unforgiving. It really is unforgiving. 
countless racing drivers who come to me and said, you know, I've said to them, you know, you're only seven tenths of a second off pole position. That's not bad going. <laughs> and they said, yeah, but we lost three tenths. We could have been 30 places higher on the grid than we were. You know, it's just, it's such a big deal. And you've got to get it absolutely spot on. And Shedden had some very difficult years, actually, in the World Cup, very difficult seasons, where he assumed that because of his status as a British champion, mm. it was just going to be a lot more laid out for him. Mm. But he's had to he's had to eat a lot of humble pie. He's had to kind of go, okay, this wasn't quite mm. the right idea. This wasn't quite... Uh, and do you know that the whole thing about the World Championship and the British Championship is so funny because back in the day, as you know, the British Championship was effectively the World Championship yeah. for touring cars. That was where all the major manufacturers used to come and play ball, mm. and with billion dollar budgets. Mm. So it's funny because the British Touring Car Championship is still pound for pound, and audience wise, it's probably still the best touring car championship in the world. But in the eyes of the guys in Europe, they're trying to make the World Championship bigger and better. But it's like, I'm talking, I've been talking to Jason Plato about this several times, and he said, you know, it would be absolutely suicidal for him personally mm. to go and race in the World Touring Car Cup. Absolutely suicidal. Commercially, it would be a terrible idea. Yeah. In terms of his racing, he'd have to learn from scratch all over again. Mm. Uh, the only thing he would enjoy is the jet set lifestyle. And even he said, you know, I'm kind of, I've kind of done that bit. I've, yeah. I've kind of, you know, that was, that was years ago I could have taken advantage of that. Mm. But, you know, and, and I think the reverse was true for Tom. You know, Tom Chilton built himself a little bit of a niche in Europe in the World Championship, and it was going really well for him. And then all of a sudden, you know, his drive disappeared. Mm. So now he's kind of had to reinvent himself by coming back to Britain. Mm. And it's changed. It's changed completely. You know, when Tom Chilton was last huge in the British Touring Cars, it was what, 2010, 2011? Yeah. So the sport has changed completely in the last 10 years. And it's difficult when you're not part of that year in, year out, because you've got to spend about four to five race weekends getting back into the flow and figuring out how it's changed. Because yeah. even though the format is similar, you know, everything uh, has changed. Race, racing is like that. You know, it changes from race to race, never mind from year to year. Mm. So it's such a tough sport to adapt to. Yeah, it is. It's if you're not there when it's evolving, it it's you you're pretty stuffed, aren't you? And it is. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. It's, it's an interesting. It's an interesting game. I've been in and out of it, and I've I've seen. You know, you go against these new people, and it's like, oh, where have they come from? It's a, uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a very interesting concept. Um, right then, Jake, you have been an absolute legend. But what? Thank you. What are we thinking then? Last question. What are we thinking about? Who is going to be leading this championship coming out of Brands? Give me your top three. Is it still going to be Sutton, Ingram, Turkington, or are we going to have other people in there? Who's going to be the top That's a really, really good question. <laughs> Such a good question. I'm going to stick my neck out on the line and say he's only 20 points back. So I've got a sneaky feeling that leaving Brands, the championship leader, will be Josh Cook. Oof. Not quite sure why I think that, but I just have a feeling that he may not win all the races. He may even get, you know, as a second place as his best. But this is an opportunity where all three of the big guns have got to prove they're the main shot for the title they're only five points apart yeah so there's going to be a lot of pressure on them there's going to be a lot of opportunities to make mistakes the racing is going to be rough and brutal mm. because it's brands hatch indy you know there, there's always going to be people who want to fly out of paddock hill bend side by side with another and want to come out on top so that's where the fireworks are going to start getting lit mm. and with josh I just have a feeling he'll be there to pick up the pieces and steal some spoils from people. He can be quite consistent when he needs to be. I mean, look at how brilliant he was at uh, the first two races at Thruxton. He's mm. got a good car underneath him. And thanks to the results at Snedden, he's not going to have a heavily ballasted car. Mm. So I think he's got a chance to walk away with the championship lead. It'll only be by a point or two at the most. Mm. But I wouldn't be surprised if Cookie was leading by the time we left Brown. Mm. Oh, very nice. All right then, who's second and third? Second, I'd say we go for Ingram and then Sutton third. Wow. I've just got a feeling, I've just got a feeling. It's a bit left field, it's a bit left field because I don't think Turkington won't be strong because he definitely will be. Mm. But it's about time a hammer blow went the way of one of the big guns. And mm. I just think, purely on, purely on coincidence or whatever it might be, Turkington's going to go and take the fall first and then bounce back in triumphant fashion. 
absolutely love it mate i love it do you know what i i love that and i do think you're dead right there's there's no way you can go through a whole championship season without having that sledgehammer swing your way so yeah I'm, no way i'm thinking you're right there and if there is a bit of precipitation in the air mate it could be it could be the one it could be the one um super right jake Thank you for coming along. Good luck with everything Downforce Radio, and uh, I will see you on the undercut uh, very soon after we leave Brands Hatch. So that'll be good. We'll get people to have a listen into that. And I'm going to yeah. jump off the phone, let you go and do some work because I know you're doing the commentary <laughs> for karting and you're always working. But also, that's very I'm kind of you. Going to give Jake Hill a ring, and I'm going to ask him his views from a driver's point of view, mate, in a minute. So that will be awesome. Thanks for joining us, Captain, and uh, it's a pleasure as always. And hopefully, we'll have you back on soon. Superb, thank you very much, and thank you to everyone for allowing me to come on. Brilliant. Ah, <laughs> top man. Cheers, Jake. You see you in a bit, lad. Cheers, buddy. See you later, mate. Bye bye. Bye. All right. Right. Oh, a bit of Christine and the Queens. Actually, we're going to be answering some questions in a bit, aren't we? So you're going to. Uh, hopefully, there's some music questions. We're allowed to play music if this is going on YouTube, I'm not too sure we are. Um, anyway, anyway, interesting to hear from Jake Sanson. Jake is a commentator, of, but he watches so much racing, he's got such a good depth of knowledge about everything that goes on. Um, and it's good to see him on the national scene, especially with uh, with a lot of the, the tin top series around the UK as well, so really cool to have him involved. Right then, I reckon it's time to do something else. I'm going to get a coffee. I'll see you in a bit. Right then, let's give Jakey Hill a little ring. I haven't spoke to this rascal for a while. Let's see what he is up to. You bet he'd love to know what all of these drivers are actually called in my phone. It's a bit loud, isn't it? Let's get that turned down. To be uh, interesting from uh, from Jake. Hello, Jake Hill. Hello, are you all right? Yeah, I'm Sam. Thanks, mate. I uh, I speak to your dad more than I speak to you, mate. Mate, we don't see each other anymore, do we? With the COVID restrictions at Toka, so it's a bit of a shame, really. It is, mate. Hey, do you know what's really weird, Jake? Is I have. I have literally forced my way into meeting not not that he's an, an honourable lad, Jack Butel. I had never yeah. met him until the media day at Silverstone because of COVID restrictions, and I would still not have met him if it wasn't for me going to the media day and making sure I'd just give him a little uh, shoulder shoulder bump, mate. <laughs> Mate, that's crazy, isn't it? It's, it's such a shame. We, you know, I really miss seeing everyone. You know, from from my TV side, it, it's weird because you know it, it was nice to uh, uh, snap um, because obviously we got to finally be interviewed by by Lou again. But yeah, you just don't get to see anyone. You know, it's such a shame. And like I said to you the other day, I, I, I haven't seen you or spoke to you in. In months, I thought you got the on with me. <laughs> I know, I did laugh at the message when you sent me. I was like, mate, what are you up to? Uh, do you want to do a little uh, preview of uh, brands? And you were like, oh, oh, I thought I'd done something wrong. But it's, 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 it's actually because like, people people have seen our social media. We're like real good friends. Me, you, Jay, Jack Goff, Josh Cook, those yeah. kind of people. We, we're in the same circles. But um, it's been weird, isn't it? Because there's been no automotive jobs that we usually see each other on either. No, not really. Everything's just gone quiet, hasn't it? You know, we used to have such a laugh uh, with each other on, on the jobs, and, and I think it was our four-year anniversary since that Kia job we did. <laughs> and uh, that, was, that was the best fun, wasn't it? Is that four years ago? Four years, I think it was four years ago, yeah. Mate, that's absolutely nuts. Yeah. Oh, hey, listen, the good times are looking like they're starting to return, mate, so it's... Um, this is true. It is, it's cool, mate. And listen, the good times were really returning for you at Thruxton and we seen what you did and it was amazing leading the championship. You went on to Snetterton and I, I looked at the qualifying sheet and I was like, oh my word, Jake Hill, that is an astounding job that you guys did. But did you have any idea what was going to happen that weekend? Did you have an inkling of maybe what was ahead of you because of the problems with um, you know, grip and things like that with the, with the extra weight in the car? Well, everything um, everything we had done pre-season testing, we, we only we only did 
three days and we had we had issues with two of them so we didn't really get four days but everything we had done was always with weight um, at the start of the year and it was always with 75 kilos with the hope that we were always going to be fairly heavy this year um, you know we've, we've been up there in the championship and you know so we, we went to Fruxton and Fruxton was obviously brilliant uh, and then we went to Snet and so I didn't actually test at Snet in pre-season so that's the first time I drove the focus at Snet was um, FP1 uh, we only got three laps because we had a Valtteri Bottas. The wheel nut sheared itself onto the hub and we couldn't get it off. No. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So we, we only did four laps in FP1. So that really sort of screwed us over um, in terms of track time. So then we had to sort of do our best guess, really, for FP2. And luckily enough, it was it was good enough to get the car in a window for qualifying. Yeah, and what a lap that was, mate, for quality. That, that's one of the better laps I've seen a front-wheel drive car do because we kind of near enough expect it in a rear-wheel drive car to a point, don't we, with weight yeah. on? Yeah, yeah, no, you're right. I mean, you know, Turks is, is always obviously fantastic and he's always really good with weight and he's always good at snet. You know, he, he beat me to pole there last year um, when I was in the FK2 and he was he was 75 kilos and he managed to still get pole. Mm. Um, and obviously the rear wheel drive sort of struck again really, WSR were on fire at SNEP um, and yeah but I'm, you know, I'm really proud of myself, we, we did a great job in qualifying and like you say I really gave it everything I could um, especially in, in Q1 to get through and then obviously again in Q2 and yeah I was chuffed to bits with, with P7, um, it was yeah what a great way to start the weekend especially with you know, Cook and Plato, who were my closest people in the championship, mm. they were way down in like 15th and 19th. So mm. it was a really good way to start. Yeah, yeah, it was, mate. And uh, can I ju just quickly, can just touch on what, what went on for the rest of the weekend? I know you had uh, traction issues and with tyres on the soft and things like that. Was it just a case of we know what we've done, maybe got the setup a bit a bit ski with and, and we go again? We forget about what happened at Snet. Is that the deal? Yeah, so sort of. we um, yeah we had a, we had a great race one really. We, we only dropped a couple. We finished ninth in race one with with the weight. Obviously, got rid of most of that weight for race two. Um, we thought we we thought we'd go soft tire for race two so that we could obviously keep in the top twelve mm. for hopefully the reverse grid for then have an absolute blinder of a race three. Yeah. And yeah, we've we just got it wrong. You yeah. know, we we got the setup wrong. We haven't we haven't done enough with a soft tire to fully understand it. Um, you know, my my car is set up quite differently to Ollie Jackson's in lots of ways. Mm -hmm. So the the route that he went, uh, although we were both on the soft tire, the route that he went and I went on paper, they looked like two different cars. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, whatever he he they did with their with their side of the garage was was spot on and it worked and mm -hmm. we just got it wrong wrong with my car really and um and then yeah so we we finished 24th in race two with canvas coming through the through the tire and then uh in race three we we're having an absolute blind we got up to 12th in three laps from 24th and then uh we had we had uh we had a slight air filter issue and yeah mm -hmm. we lost ah. a load of power basically ah. Gee, what is it with you and power in engines <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't. Don't. Hey, well, you know, it's one of those things. Hey, listen, Jake, it could be an omen, that second race that you had, finishing 24th, mate. Your race number's 24. <laughs> so yeah, I've, got, I've got high hopes, and what I look at is when I look at the championship, I mean, if you someone had said to you, you're going to be fifth, you're going to have, what, 23 points off the lead, you're going to be... Yeah. This, you know, a real top runner. You're going to have already had podiums. Would you have took that, or would you have wanted like six race wins? <laughs> <laughs> everyone, everyone wants six race wins. I mean, it's it's hard, you know, because it's. I look at, you know, I look at Ash and I look at Turks. I think, you know, they are hmm. they are really doing a, a good job, and they're so fast, you know. Hmm. Um, they're so so fast, and you know, maybe we don't quite have the outright pace that a rear wheel drive car on a good day has, especially yeah. with Asher or Turks behind the wheel. Mm. Um, but but we might have a more consistent car, you know, mm. we might do. Um, and we might, you know, I'm, I think I'm getting my head around this touring car game now and, you know, I'm feeling really good and, and Motorbase and MB, MB Motorsport are providing me with such a good car mm. um, and I'm trying my hardest not to waste it, you know. I mean, you, you know what it's like. It's, mm. it's It takes so much effort to try and get into a really good car and a really good team with good people around you 
And when you finally have that, I just don't want to waste it, really. Yeah, I would say, mate, that I think you're undermining yourself there. I think it's took you probably 12 years to, to be in the position, <laughs> yeah. to be in the position yeah. you're in. And what us as fans and pundit people don't realise sometimes, even though I've been there, is that it's 10 weekends, it's, it's like... It's twenty days. It's twenty days, isn't it? Of, yeah, of building up, you know, to what you've you've got now and you can't waste anything of it. And um I don't think you are, mate, and everyone in the paddock knows you're the you're the boy, so it's all about front wheel drive versus rear wheel drive, isn't it, at the end of the day, and that's that's what it's always gonna be about. Um what about then Jake Hill? We move on to Brands Hatch, home circuit for you, home circuit for the team, isn't it? Motor base, they're literally it is. Yeah. Turn right out the circuit. No, it's turn left out the circuit. And, uh, turn left, yeah. <laughs> and they're down there about 400 yards on the left. Yeah, literally, they're, they're one mile away. I think they're, or even a little bit closer than that, like three quarters of a mile away from the brand's uh, entrance, yeah. It's crazy. Um, so they're just, just on the outskirts of West Kingstown, which is a village that Brands is in. So, yeah, it's, um, it's close. You know, we have say it's home. You yeah. know, for, for me, Brands has always been home, always will be. And it, I think it's the circuit I know best, especially the GP circuit. But, mm. you know, in some ways, it, it's good that the GPs last because yes. if I'm going to go there fighting for a championship, mm. then, well, good yeah. luck to everyone else because it's my home. So, <laughs> you know, it's going to be a, it's a nice place to end the year. So mm. I'm, I'm happy that we're doing Indy first <clears throat> and I love the Indy and I'm, I'm confident with the car. And the one good thing about uh, being fifth in the championship as opposed to leading it is obviously one crucial factor, which is the weight. Yeah. Um, so I think I've got 39, 38 kilos, something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. For yeah, for for uh, qualifying and obviously all of Saturday and race one. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a nice amount of weight. I would say anything up to sort of 46 kilos or so, and um, it doesn't really affect the car too much. So I'm feeling really confident in what we've got, mm. and um, yeah, I'm, I'm just hoping to have. I'm hoping to be back on the podium, to be honest, Harry. That's what we need to do. Yeah, no, for sure, mate, because like I've spoken about before, points make prizes, and you having uh, three third places at uh, Thruxton really really shown that it's about consistency. But you know, you mentioned about the yeah. weight, Jake. Um, I was speaking to Matt Neal about the FK8 Honda, and he said it it's actually not that bad if you get it right, because it can give you more traction. Is that right in you, for you? Um, maybe, in, maybe in the wet, a bit more, yeah. um, but uh, I think that the problem is with the drop with the dry is that the tire degradation becomes that much more. Yeah. You know, so in, so initially the car initially the car doesn't feel much different. You know, he's absolutely right. For the first sort of five laps of any sort of stint on a on a decent set of tires, you know, the car doesn't feel much different with with it being fully loaded up with weight. Mm. Um, but it's then you know those last five laps where obviously the weight has taken its toll on the tyre. And you really, you just really struggle just to just to get out of the corner, you know. Mm. And the biggest thing we know is, is just the straight line speed difference between me and my teammates um, with, with the weight on board. Mm. Um, it really slows the car down. So, mm. yeah, um, it, uh, Matt's right. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't affect the car so much in the early stages and especially um, when you're on a newer tyre. But at the end of a race distance, yeah, it struggles a bit. Mm. It's interesting what you say there because I was covering another Tin Top Championship over the weekend and yeah. people were just struggling so much out of clearways in front wheel drive cars. Um, clearways, obviously, the last corner. It's not, it, you know, if you have a bit of wheel spin at the apex, you know yeah. in your head you've just got to look in your mirrors, haven't you, straight away. It's not like any other corner because yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're you no. kind of like kinked right for a long time, full throttle hoping you got the run. On the person behind. No, you're absolutely right, and especially, you know, especially when if I'm going to be fighting against Ash and Colin, you know, those those boys are, you know, they've got so much traction, haven't they, with the rear wheel drive? You know, mm. Druids and Clearways, that's their that's their baby. You know, they they can just get it gone out of the corner, and um, yeah, so you know, I think initially we probably we probably handled a little bit better through through those corners, but mm. at the end, the last five laps again. Regardless of whether you got weight on or not, you know those those rear wheel drive boys. They really come at you coming out of clearways, and obviously have the have the run going down the back straight. Mm. Is it Jake? Is it swings and roundabouts, then? So if you talk us through a lap, mate, because you're the boy around there. So Paddock Hill Bend, fifth gear. At what mile an hour is that? Fifth gear, uh, 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think exactly what what speed it is, but it's, it's roughly sort of 95 mile an hour apex speed. I would have thought. Mm. Um, so it's pretty pretty quick, but. You know, the, the key thing there, especially with racing, is if you're trying to get an overtake done, it's either being super late on the brakes down the inside or trying to set the driver up in front for the switch back up the hill um, mm. to get up the inside for Drury's. But yeah, fifth gear, big compression um, at the bottom of paddock, car hits the floor, um, and you're using as much curb as you can get away with without being pinged by the, by the <laughs> sensors. <laughs> um, and then yeah as you head up towards towards Drew it's still fifth gear and then it's a, br- a massive break uh, underneath the bridge I think we all use the bridge as a really good marker for braking point uh, down towards second gear um, and again hug it really really nice and tight pretty much all the way around around the corner and again focusing on traction you know traction is the big key out of there to get it get it going down the hill um, third we up to fourth, I think, yeah, up to fourth, and then back on to third again um, for Graham Hill. And this one's really a case of just carrying as speed as we can through the corner. Um, again, not too much apex curve because it can ping the car off mm-hmm. um, and obviously make you run wide. And again, using as much curve as we can get away with without being uh, being done on the exit there. Mm-hmm. And then up to fifth gear on the back straight, and it's literally a case of just a small lift turn in, hope for the best, take as much curve as possible, um, and then full throttle again over the curve uh, through the Kink McLean, and then uh, braking hard down to third gear for, for clearways. And again, you know, this is the key area really where it's going to be front wheel drive versus rear wheel drive with, mm. with the traction side of things. And this is probably where you're going to see the most amount of overtakes um, being happening, I reckon. Yeah, that's interesting, mate, because a great lap, by the way. Thank you. I think you're on pole there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But actually, no. Actually, I think you. No. I think you lost two tenths when you didn't know whether to go up into third on the rev limiter. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Do you just let it pass or not? <laughs> but it it is funny what you say because if you're battling against a front wheel drive car or a rear wheel drive car, your driving will change. Your dynamics will change, won't they? Because if if I'm in a if I'm in a front wheel drive car against a rear drive car going up to Druids, you've got to get the undercut done because. They're right. going to have so much traction and could actually hang it round the outside unless you unwind the lock and smash him off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's one way of looking at it, isn't it? Um, but yeah, it's, it's, you're right. It's really, really hard, you know. And even if even once you are past the person, if you manage to get it done up towards Druids, you know, again, people try and get a bit of a cutback again out of, out of Druids towards mm. Graham Hill. Mm. And you've got to be so defensive, especially against those real drive cars. So... Mm. Yeah, it's going to be tough, you know, and I'm really looking forward to, to racing racing everyone again. Mm. Um, and I'm just praying that we can we can stick it up the front and, mm. yeah, disappear into the sunset would be a lovely way to go, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure that's not going to happen, you know. It's going to, be, it's going to be a hard, hard weekend. But the only thing I am thankful for is that both Ash and Colin um, are obviously now first and second in the championship and they're heavy. So yeah. that's one thing we've got against them. Both, both me and Cookie... You know, we're both good round brands, and we've both fought long and hard round there before. And um, now it's switched roles a little bit. We're the light ones, a uh, mm. circuit that probably suits us quite well. So I'm mm. looking forward to it. Yeah. What do you think about the weather, though, Jake? It looks like it's going to rain at least once or twice over the weekend. But brands is a bit of a microclimate, isn't it? Do you go there and think, right, do you actually go there with two mindsets? If it's dry, I'm going to do this team. If it's wet, I'm going to do this team. Or... Am I right in saying your seat of your pants, you, and you just turn up and go, right, what we got, let's crack on? <laughs> yeah, to- totally seat of pants. I couldn't care less what it is. I couldn't care less. In, in some ways, I sort of want it to be wet because I feel like we've got a slight advantage over the real drive cars if it is wet, mm. um, especially yeah, uh, the BMW, for whatever reason, they struggle a little bit more in the wet. Mm. So, um, yeah, I, I don't care, really. And if it's mixed, well, you know how much I love it when it's mixed. Um, they are my favourite, favourite conditions and it's always slicks, that's what I found out, it's always slicks, <laughs> so uh, yeah, if, if, even if it is absolutely tipping it down like it was at Thruxton on the grid, um, yeah, <laughs> give it a go, you never know, um, so yeah, it's, it's great, you know, I, I, I really don't mind what weather it is, I'm really looking forward to it regardless, um, and yeah, if it is a bit wet, then then that's cool and if it is dry then that's also cool you know it really doesn't bother me at all i think we've got a good car regardless mm-hmm. 
important and I think that's what that's what will make you you know uh, maybe the man at the end of the year that can that can be in one of those top five positions to battle for the title for the for the very last race mate and it'd be great to see it um Jake I know you're busy mate last couple of questions I was just going to ask you mate about um who's who's really surprised you this year out of everybody on the grid um I'll tell you mine first I think Tom Ingram. I knew he was going to be quick, mate, and I know you know him pretty well from Junior Formula, and you guys have come up through yeah. the weeks together. But I didn't, I didn't know that they would get on top of that car so fat, so so quickly, mate. He's done a good job, and he, to be fair, he probably thinks the same about you. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I think you know it's it's vice versa. Probably a lot of people do think the same about us with the forward. But I, I totally agree with you, actually, Paul. I think Tom is is the bigger surprise I mean I don't I don't doubt him as a, as a driver at all you know I've raced against him enough times now to know that how you know that he is good um, and that he will deliver when he's when he's got what he needs with the car and and yeah I, mean, I am surprised that they've managed to get on top of it so quickly but mm. I, I think I'm right in thinking that he's got his engineer from the Corolla um, yes. so yeah. you know they that is such a big part of it you know having that relationship with an engineer um, and having that know-how of what mm. what Tom wants yeah. and therefore what the engineer needs to make that work mm. so if that is the case and he has got his engineer from the Corolla stuff then then it's no surprise really that they've got on top of it so quick mm. because they all just understand each other so well yeah. and I imagine that the Hyundai as a platform is quite a good little chassis mm. so I wouldn't have thought it would have made, it would have made a massive difference setup wise from what they had on the Corolla I would have thought um, but yeah it's, it's still it's impressive to see how quick they've got on top of it they obviously had a great showing uh, they're, they're arguably the best front wheel drive car at SNET mm -hmm. um, so fair play to them you know it's, it's like I say it swings around about so it'll come back our way mm -hmm. but they are doing a good job and for me they're, they're the biggest surprise but also actually a bit of a shout out to, to Adam Morgan I, actually, yes. I was really impressed with him really impressed with him because they've really been struggling and, it, and they're, they're happy to admit they've been struggling with the car mm -hmm. um, and Adam to be fair to him he just he just got stuck in big time and he did a, I thought he did a really good job at SNET with that mm. BMW so yeah mm. well done to them as well yeah fair play sis they showing the metal because they had a shocker of a first round at Thruxton and and to be fair, Matt yeah. Neal did pull pull me up and say, "Listen, Adam Morgan is one of the most underrated drivers on the grid, and I think yeah. it's just because he's quiet and he's northern. He just gets on with it, like you say. But his his teammate, on the other hand, Tom Chilton, and I think Tom is one of the fastest people I've ever met over one lap in a front wheel drive car. Do you think he's bit off a bit more than he can chew with this, or will it come to him as well? Yeah, possibly. You know, he's been in front-wheel drive stuff for so long, hasn't he? Um, and it's arguably what he knows best. I think that's, you know, it's not an unfair comment. Um, but it's, yeah, he, he seems to be struggling more than more than Adam. Um, I don't know yeah, what's going on there, but, you know, I guess it's up to him to find out what it is that, that they're missing, really, or whether he just needs more time. And who knows, you know, we've got, after Brands, we've got a two-day test at Alton Park. All of us have, uh, with a tyre test. Um, and that'll be, you know, that'll be a good chance for everyone to get a bit more stuck into their car and mm. see what see what they can do from Alton Park onwards. Yeah, defo, mate. Um, just one last one, fella. I just want to ask yeah. you because you're a driver. Gordon Shedden coming back into the championship. You can't, you cannot doubt that that man is fast. He's had a bit of a rough start, but do you think he's come yeah. back into the championship and, and now he's seen it has moved on? a bit driver wise probably but also driving standards wise because he seemed to get into a, a couple of um, scuffles like not his fault some of them but it just seems like he's just trying to play himself back in because he's a proper talent three time British champion yeah no no question you know um, Shed is, is one of the best drivers you know on, on the grid absolutely and, you know he's yeah there's, there's no question about his speed or, or the team you know Dynamics are a great team aren't they they've done it for so so long and the FK is fast and mm. both him and Robo you know it's a really good pairing right there but yeah like you say he's, yeah he's been caught up in a couple of couple of messy situations isn't he so far mm. um, obviously uh, the, the team messed up slightly in qualifying for him at SNET which put him on the back foot um, and obviously it happens you know we, we've all had stuff like that whether it's bodywork rear wing whatever we've had, we've all had it happen to us at some point and it was unfortunate after to him when he got pole so um mm. it's not 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 a great way but yeah it's um i mean what do i think to him coming back it's, it's good you know it is good um 
I think it's it's nice for me to fight against Shedden rather than Matt because I don't know if Matt still loves me or not. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, it's it's good. It's good to fight. I've not fought against Shedden before, and to be honest, I still haven't yet. Really, mm-hmm. uh, we've not had that that fight. But things have moved on. You know, I think you know. You go back to when he when he pulled out of it last time, mm. uh, went off to Europe. You know, I just started in touring cars, and you know, Cook, same same with Cook. Really, he hadn't done that much when Shedden left. Yeah. Um, and now we're all at the forefront of it, aren't we? Yeah. You know, we're we're right at the front. So he's fighting a totally different crowd yeah. to what he's probably used to. Yeah. Um, not that it should matter because you just fight who you got to fight on the day. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it is it is a different scene. I think the driving standards are a lot a lot fairer, a lot cleaner. Mm. You know, Ian Watson and the Toka crew have done a great job of yeah. of making it a better place to race, yeah. and it is a better place to race, and it's a it's a much safer place to race. Um, so that's I think that's fantastic. Mm. Um, so yeah, it has moved on, but at the same time, you know, Shed is a is you know he's, he's a grown boy. He knows what he's doing. He's fast. He's quick. Mm. Um, the team are mega and he'll be right there as he always is yeah no definitely mate love it absolutely love it right the very very final question because I know you're at Donington looking after a client no you're right. yeah go go, know, go go I know you're very busy mate because you're coaching today in uh, the, is it the Ginetta GTA you're looking after an Assetto driver that's right yeah I look after Assetto with some of their juniors and, and GTAs now so I'm just with Roy Aldersley today who oh. uh, uh, drive, drives with JRT in their historic stuff as well so we're just uh, doing a bit of coaching which is good oh very nice I love that GTA Grand Theft Auto Ginettas it sounds amazing <laughs> no, I, <don't. laughs> I, I said that on no. live television and Richard John Neal was like no mate no, 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 no. <laughs> oh, that was amazing. Um, this question might make you squirm a bit because I got a bit of grief, yeah. mate, on television for it. But I wasn't having a go at Ash and his team. But all I was saying was, if that car had have won the last race at Snetterton and not finished P two, would people have questioned what was going on because Shedden couldn't get past him in a soft tired, unladen FK eight Honda? Or is Ash just that good? I mean, it's the championship winning car and Ash is brilliant, isn't he? But it will raise yeah. eyebrows, doesn't it, mate? You know the score. Yeah, I mean, I have, I have no doubt Ash is, Ash is probably going to be one of the hardest people I've ever raced against in my life yeah. or ever will race against. He's, he's absolutely brilliant. And, mm-hmm. you know, I have, no, I have no problem admitting that he's a really good driver, you know. Um, so, yeah, no, no question to that. But it, it does, it does, it does make you wonder sometimes. You know, mm. it does just think. You know, the amount of times I've been behind that Infinity now, yeah. and the thing is an absolute monster yeah. uh, when it needs to be. Mm-hmm. But there's, at the same time, there's no question he's driving it well. You know, you only have to look at Aiden and yeah. Carl. Yeah. Um, you know, Aiden especially. You know, he's. I mean, they're not slow. Yeah. You know, um, race the race winner he, is Aiden a lot. It's a multi race, race winner. winner. Yeah. yeah, and so it, but it does. It does make you wonder sometimes, mm. you know, what is is there? A, I don't. I hate. I hate having that yeah. sort of, you know, that it was, stuff. Because what I've had it for me in the past, where people are going, oh, they're cheating. Yeah. You know, and I don't think they're cheating. but no. It does make you question. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. I thought I wanted to ask a driver because, like I said, I was not throwing the cheating thing around. I was just saying, no, just has saying, have they no. got it so right that other people have just it's. I think it put it really did push a lot of teams into an uncomfortable corner um, last year when that car won the championship. It really did, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Especially it was it was a completely unknown, wasn't it? You know, it came into the championship as a as a new shell, um, and everyone really didn't know how it was going to get on. Even Ash was like, I remember seeing Ash at the start of twenty twenty mm. um, at media day, and he's like, "Mate, the car was finished like four days ago." And, you know, we have no clue, you know, what it's going to do. Mm. And it, it rocked up and won the bloody championship. <laughs> and, it, you know, it, um, it does make you question it. But, you know, you've got to look back. Honda have done it in the past. You yeah. know, FK2, FK8, rocked mm. up, done the job, gone home. You know, it's happened. Mm. Uh, BMW have done it multiple times with their cars. Yeah. Um, you know, it has happened. It will continue to happen. But at the same time, I do follow that Infinity and think, oh, that looks good. It does, <laughs> you know, that does yeah. look good. I love that when you, yeah. when you follow a car and you're like, oh, I wish I was in that today. Hey, listen, Jake, 
I'm going to let you go, mate. My SD card's about to run out because I've spoken too much. You, and that's usual for me. Mate, you're an absolute ledge. I can't wait to see how you get on it, Brands. You've got lots of new fans. You're a star driver. I really wish you the best, mate. And uh, thanks for joining us. And you get back to some work, mate, and making some coin. Yeah, thanks, mate. <laughs> see you soon. Nice one, JP. <laughs> see you, mate. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 <laughs> Woo! Oh, my word. Jakey Hill. That was cool, wasn't it? Got an, we got a lap out of him as well around Branzach. Um, honestly, my SD card, I can see it just counting down there. So I better, uh, I better make sure we get uh, we get this done before it switches off. So thanks to Jake Hill. Um, just rem I'm just going to remind everyone, make sure you listen to Downforce Radio because me and Jake Sanson, um, who you listened to just a bit earlier on, we've got um, a show called The Undercut and it's awesome listening to what Jake's got to say as well on that show. Um, and obviously myself, we have a right, right giggle on it, all about British touring cars, all about tin tops and it's great to speak about uh, national racing as well. So yes, guys, thank you. And as usual, kisses for you. Mwah.